Welcome to the Humble Hoof Podcast. My name is Alicia Harlov. This is a podcast for both horse owners and hoof care professionals, offering discussions into various philosophies on the health of the hoof and soundness of your horse. Please check us out on Facebook or at thehumblehoof.com. Most people who listen to this podcast know that I'm a hoof care provider that doesn't work with metal. My business focuses on healthy bare feet and composite shoeing packages as needed. Because of this, I connected with Mark Johnson, another composite-minded farrier, and asked if we could have a conversation about his journey from a traditional UK-trained farrier to doing what he does now. I'm so glad he suggested bringing Matthew Jackson and Robbie Richardson into the conversation too, because their input was so interesting. What started as me looking for a conversation about the journey from working with steel to a shift to composites became a very candid conversation that covers a whole lot more. I didn't know if we want to just go around and have everybody do a brief introduction to start, you know, say your name, what area you work in, you know, what your primary focus is, uh, that kind of thing. Suits me. That's Robbie. Perfect. So, Mark, do you want to start? Sure. Hi, Alicia. Hi, and thank you very much for having us on. Where do I start? I've been a farrier forever, I suppose. It all began about six years old when I saw my first horse being shod, and then I decided that's what I wanted to do. 14 years old, I'm traveling out to see the man who subsequently gave me the apprenticeship, and now I'm the wrong side of 21. (laughs) So it's been horse's feet all the way. (laughs) That's awesome. Robbie, do you want to go next? Yeah, fine. Yeah, left school as soon as I could. I started an apprenticeship. Um, very lucky to have a master who basically taught me how to learn. Very little else, but he did teach me how to learn. I was then lucky enough to join up with a vet who encouraged me to go and work with him at the Exeter University in the physics lab to uh, study biomechanics. So I sort of got into the whole remedial side and then went out and, and hung my shoe up and, and I was shoeing for 36 years or whatever. And then one day I saw a horse that had amazing feet. I was asked to go and do a pre-purchase inspection because the vet didn't want to pass it as sound because it didn't have shoes on, which uh, um, was quite amazing. But it was one actually that had been under the management of Nick Barker. Oh, yeah. And I went back home, went back home. Uh, Nick Barker's yard is, is not far from me. but um, So I took myself back home and realized that um, maybe I'd been not getting it wrong, but it was time for a change. So subsequently, although I had a clinic running at the time for surgical shoeing and referrals, I realized that even if I was putting on the perfect shoe, it was only the horse that could make the perfect foot. And um, so I, I, that was the last time I drove a nail. That was 14 years ago. Wow. That's yeah. <laughs> awesome. And uh, Matthew? Um, much the same as these guys um, left school as soon as, I, as soon as I could. Uh, I was very, very fortunate to get an apprenticeship when I was 16. I did two years before I went to college, which was quite interesting because by the time I got to college, I already had my own shoeing round. So I suppose that kind of set you up to kind of maybe learn a little bit different. So I'm probably the black sheep amongst these guys. I'm kind of pretty much semi-retired now through various issues and things like that. But the passion for feet and the passion for trying to make amends to what we're seeing every day it's never really died. Do you know what I mean? It, it gets under your skin. It becomes part of who you are. I suppose that kind of desire to seek answers. Yeah, for sure. And so did all three of you go through the traditional schooling in the UK? I know that your schooling is a lot more rigorous than here in the States for farrier work. Yes, I, th- I think we did. Ours is very, very centered on the blacksmithing side of it. The, the steel side of it is very strong in the whole process. I, I certainly did. The emphasis is still on how good you are at an anvil rather than at a hoof. If you're no good at the anvil, you won't really succeed as a, a farrier in the sense of recognition by the education system. Um, you have to be good at making shoes. We are hoping that it'll change. And maybe farriers like us, are, uh, that's what our job is, to try and change it. Like Matthew, I'm sort of semi-retired now, but my enthusiasm for composites and boots and trying to get the horse to self-heal is is where my target is. And that definitely isn't taught and wasn't taught through my educational career. And so for people who maybe don't know much about what that schooling looks like, can you talk to us a little bit about how long you have to study it to be a farrier in the UK and what that certification looks like and what it focuses on? I know you kind of touched on that. It was just a a very 
sort of structured time, lots of lots of repetition and steady building on the next stage. I think officially, Alicia, we're, we're looking at sort of four years and two months. And then nowadays there are block release periods at college where they go away from the training barrier to college to brush up on the specifics, et cetera, that, that might be missing or that need covering specifically for the syllabus. And and then obviously at the end of that culminates in a, a three-part examination. So you've got theory, you've got practical, and you've got an oral. And then, yeah, we got we got pulled up for it um, a couple of years back, but it's, it's now rolling again. But I think probably all three of us on this phone call would like to see it rolling in a different direction. But yeah, I mean, it, mine was mine was a very traditional apprenticeship. I'm very fortunate. It's a funny thing when you're learning to do anything, isn't it? You need to have guidelines and ground rules to be able to work from. That's how you begin. That's where you can build your experience from. And my employer was very, very good at that. However, he did insist that we always looked at other people working. And um, we always questioned them as well. And I think that was a really, really good move. We had our ground rules, but uh, very much a case of going and looking and seeing what everybody else was doing. Definitely. It's quite interesting because unlike these chaps, I was actually at college when the change sort of happened. I think we all went to Hereford. That was the main fiery school at the time. And the first lesson was shewing as a necessary evil. And that what you applied to the horse's foot was to get a result. It wasn't specifically what you applied to the horse's foot. During that point, certainly the four years I was there, there was there was lots of composites just starting to come onto the market and people were playing around with it. And it was very interesting because I think with tradition, which I think is quite an interesting word, there was a huge fear that they were going to start losing their blacksmithing skills. Now, the blacksmithing skills was very interesting. What we were taught through blacksmithing was to fabricate steel for the need of the horse, whatever that was going to look like. Again, you know, you were kind of marked and judged on that. You were judged on symmetry. The kind of core theory alongside that was if you could create symmetry by making a handmade shoe, you could you could adapt a shoe to the horse's needs. So that was very much so what I was taught sort of at Hereford and things. And there was quite an interesting story at the time. There was one of the lecturers, which I won't mention, a fantastic chap. He said one day that, and, he, and I think he'd been misquoted in the horse and hound, he'd said, it doesn't matter what you put on a horse's foot. You can put a dustbin lid onto a horse's foot as long as it does the job you're asking of it. And he got into a bit of trouble for that. It was misquoted. It was, uh, you could put a dustbin laid onto a horse's foot and people wouldn't know the difference. And and I think that was a huge shame because the chap at the time, what he was trying to instill in everybody was that use whatever you have at your disposal. But then again, when I started sort of getting out at the other end of qualifying and things, there was this huge fear and this 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 sort of push on losing traditional blacksmithing skills. So the emphasis started swinging back around to sort of shoemaking and things. Right. Definitely. I, I sort of had a, a foot in both camps because, like Matthew, I went to Hereford and it was at the early days. And w- when I qualified and then worked for a while as a general practitioner, but also working at Exeter Physics Lab, I was then asked, because there was only one other college at the time, which was near us at Bastable, and I got a phone call out of the blue to ask if I would take on teaching there. So I became a teacher at the college. And one of the things that amazed me was that I was instantly asked if I could also be an examiner to approve these um, people who were absolute mishmash. Some of them were coming out of the Navy and thinking, oh, I'll, I'll have a crack at being a farrier. Some of them were young apprentices. So I was getting sent to all sorts of people. And my approach was that if I'm going to be an uh, examiner along with two other examiners on the day, my approach to our governing body was that I want to see what that person is going to be doing the next day, regardless of how good their shoemaking skills were or whatever. I wanted to see them shoe a horse. So my approach was to our governing body that we will have a horse there. They're given an hour and a half to shoe the horse. And if they wanted to use ready-made, it was whatever they wanted to use, gas forge, coal forge, but I want to see what they're going to be doing so that I could approve the, that uh, their quality was of a certain standard. And the amazing part was that this was put down straight away and said, no, they've got to make one front and, and fit it in a specimen hind shoe or whatever. So, in fact, somebody, when I was qualifying, somebody could qualify having never shod a horse. 
which I, I thought was absolutely scary. And I realized that actually it's still the case. You do not shoe a horse all round and balance it and explain what you've done, why you've done. And I think that's very scary. Oh, wow. I didn't realize that. (laughs) Well, so what I'm trying to get at is obviously all of you are certainly not uneducated. You're all very well educated. And and comparatively, you know, compared to the United States, where we have no, you know, governing body, there's no certification that anybody has to get. I mean, you could have some, you know, random person come up and nail shoes onto a horse that's never had any training. You guys have all clearly studied a lot to get that certification But also all of you have since then, despite your extensive schooling and experience in metal work and shoeing, you've all sort of moved away from steel. And I would love uh, to hear if, you know, each of you has maybe a main catalyst or an event that you can think of Mm -hmm. that made you start to think of kind of dropping using the traditional shoe. Uh, I certainly can. My background worked up in the north of Scotland, trained up there. And what was interesting was you were shooing all sorts from race horses to vendors, show jumpers, and then you were doing your ponies and different things. And it was interesting. Everybody had, you know, different levels of wealth. And so you had a big mix whereby you were shooing horses, but also you were regularly trimming horses that never had shoes on. And what was interesting with it was, and it's interesting because you've talked about the word tradition, traditionally these horses were only shod for a season. These horses were, you know, maybe four or five sets and getting towards the end of that last set before the horse was roughed off. As a farrier, you were looking forward to the period when the horse's feet would recover and just give it a break from shoeing and things. But I think for me, my turning point was when I went down to college and the ponies we had to shoe and try to work on, I was trying to explain to the lecturer that these feet were incredibly unhealthy very, very flat, that kind of thing. And what I got back was, but they're all like that around here. So from that point, you started asking questions quite severely as to say, well, what's the difference here? What is it specifically that's actually happening and going on? So that that kind of inquisitive mind's always been there because what you were being taught at college was not what you were seeing and replicating out in the field. For myself, because I was in isolation, I wasn't really working with other farriers. The horse was always my guide. You know, the feedback from the horse owner was always my guide because I didn't have anybody else. But I remember qualifying and kind of, I don't know, when you work for people for a long length of time, you become very attached to them, the horses in particular. And I kind of felt I had to leave that area for to go and see if I was any good specifically in sort of like a different area and things. So I moved back down to Northumberland and really probably within first, second year of moving down there, the the indoor school started being built. And so there was a there was this pressure for to pay for them. So they started creating um, competitions through the winter. So traditionally horses were getting roughed off and this stopped happening. So then your fear then started, right, okay, you weren't shooing the horse for that point in time. You were shooing it for the next time you were going to go and see it. And it was because of the foot falling apart on you, because of what you were doing. And it kind of created a bit of a catalyst whereby you were kind of fighting against nature all the time. And you were starting to panic because you were making problems for these animals. And for me personally, that's certainly not what I signed up for. You know, I can remember um, a chap on a yard, very charismatic chap. He was a farmer, had a large livery yard, did an awful lot of hunting. And he asked me one day, he says, uh, he says, what's the difference between you and my farrier? People are saying I should have you shoe my horse. And I turn around and says, there's no difference. I says, I'll probably keep your shoes on for maybe a couple of sets longer. But I says, what we do is break on these feet. You know, it wasn't about the farrier. It was about the change specifically in the use of how people were using the horses. Yeah. I mean, the, the main difference I see now is um, when people ask me, you know, what's the difference between you know, the trimmer and the farrier is the hammer. Take away the hammer. And, you know, when I was a farrier, you couldn't take away my hammer. But now you can take away my hammer and I can still perform what I want to perform. And when I was an apprentice, I just remember that it was about the fifth day I was with my master, with my brand new shiny boots and um, apron that wouldn't fold around my legs or whatever standing there. And when we took the set of shoes off just to turn the horse away, I said, what's that for? He said, so that we can, uh, so the feet get better. 
And it, <laughs> I was three days into my apprenticeship and I thought, oh, so the feet get better without shoes on. And and I probably should have asked the question then. But, you know, um, quick as a flash, 35 years later, I cottoned on to what it was about. I'd probably like to make a statement. I think because the question was, why did we turn away from traditional shoeing? I don't think we did. I think I think what we were taught worked. I think Farry has turned away from tradition. I think horse yeah, yeah. ownership has turned away yeah, from yeah. tradition. You know, yeah. my my go to shoe was a Fitzgram shoe, and it was designed three hundred years ago because of the problems yeah. that we're seeing in carriage horses. I think we've I think we've absolutely completely lost direction because yeah. it's. It's about the need of the rider. Actually, it's wrong. It's wrong. It's not about the need of the rider. We're not. We're not looking at horses anymore and saying, "Can they do the work that is be- going to be asked of them?" And certainly, my education was all about that. It was all about what is this animal capable of doing, and it was kept within those boundaries. And through those periods, these horses were very healthy. Uh, sorry, I didn't want to sort of push Mark out. I, I just to, to, to answer that, I just have this feeling that the the public's you know image of farriery is still very much you know that there's loads of smoke coming up from between the farrier's you know legs when he's got the foot up and and the, the very yeah. picturesque yeah. thing, and we're sort of allied with you know cobblers and war dobblers and thatchers and whatever and and whereas in fact the plastic industry the boot industry the composite generally and carbon fiber um you know Derek Poopo he's invented something that that actually starts to correct our mistakes and yeah. and I think it's very tragic that it's come from from the trade uh, I think it's lovely that it has but mm-hmm. you know where was the farrier's research bringing that in and where is it going to to lead other than Farrier saying there's either a few bob in it and I don't understand what it does or I generally understand what it does and I need to do it. But am I really understanding that I'm, I'm putting right my mistakes? Yeah. yeah. I brought you two in for a reason. I knew I wouldn't have to say a lot. Um, <laughs> <laughs> oh, well, uh, thank you very much, Mark. <laughs> Bye. Um, what, why, did it, why did I turn from steel? Well, I guess, like all of us farriers, we all had a percentage of horses that didn't wear shoes on our books that we were looking after. And the frustrating thing, before Barefoot even became a, a an entity, feet that I used to look at in general, and I do generalise, looked healthier than the ones I was shoeing. So that was the first question mark. And I did actively start pursuing trying to get shoes off feet without a clue as to what I was doing, other than perhaps leaving a little bit extra foot on there. Along the way, though, I also became very, very captivated by anatomy and primarily its function. So I'm not, and I'm sure there's lots of people can name the bits far better than I can, but I'm absolutely captivated by function of anatomy. And that has manifested itself in lots of different ways. I, I don't like to think how many uh, feet I've been gifted to and legs to to go into but for a very long time there's been a very deep focus on blood flow and trying to get blood to flow through the hoof capsule through the limb getting the lymph to flow through the limb because if you can get that to happen then you've got a chance of repairing and eutrophying structure so that became its own monster in many respects because the more you look at anatomical function the more you know that a piece of steel which goes from one heel round to the other, has got no correlation with any anatomical structure that the horse possesses. There isn't isn't a a single part of that horse's body that corresponds to that rigidity and also the texture of steel. It's it's been a huge convenience, and it's certainly stopped a lot of horses limping. It's, It's improved quality of life for a lot of horses, but it's not the anatomical biomechanical answer not by any means in my opinion mm. and then the 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 real crux of this came when daisy and steve daisy bicking and steve foxworth came over and did a clinic for us over here now i wasn't into composites at the time but having having attended part of that clinic i had six horses on my books and they were the catalyst for me to go to this clinic because Quite frankly, I was depressed every time I went to them. I couldn't help them from a barefoot perspective because they were just too sore and their environments were unsuitable to really get them going barefoot. And the other side to the coin was that if I shod them in steel, their upper body asymmetry 
contradicted any long-term application of steel to their feet. And I mean, when I say long-term, I'm talking with in a shoeing cycle, they would start to go downhill. And I was really stuck with that. So coming away from Daisy and Steve's clinic, like any of us do when we see new toys, it was like, great, let's let's get going with this. And I got composite shoes of various descriptions onto all of these horses, and the results were just mind-blowing. I had horses that were more comfortable, they were standing better, but the proliferation of hoof growth was off the scale. And that was the thing that really shook me in terms of of actually getting these feet going, getting the horses moving. And of course, I had to then come back to, well, what's happened here? Why? Yes, obviously, we've got comfort. Obviously, these shoes are conformable. But what specifically in that anatomical function was allowing this to happen? And so I was straight back to the dissection table. And if you take a limb, that you've you've skinned and you've taken the outer hoof capsule off if you palpate up and down the flexible back of the foot so behind the behind the pedal bone you're getting hold of where the bulbs are and you're compressing the digital cushion up and down not expansion and contraction you get a, a, a very significant pumping action on the palmar digital vein and to me the mechanics of allowing the foot the comfort to, to come to the back of the foot to land them and then allowing that flexion to occur, you've then got a real anatomical statement that that's actually assisting the, the feet from working. And since then, I've found every excuse not to put a steel shoe on to the point where I've then been able to morph my business to a place where I never have to again. So that's me. Yeah. <laughs> I, I mean, I, I have to say to follow on from that, that Mark and I have been working sort of quite closely lately on, on getting together some courses and things. But I think that the, the work I did at the physics lab at Exeter was about expansion and contraction. And then I had to introduce compression and release, mainly because of Mark's work. Um, and and can, it convinced me that we sort of ignore that at our peril, because I think we get uh, we get paranoid about expansion and contraction. Either even the steel shoe allow enough steel for the foot to expand on, and um, you know whether we're giving extensions quarterly or medial or laterally. I think this compression and release is the thing that we should be working on. And I think if you follow on from Derek Poupard's work, that in fact, that that's probably what packing the sulci and, and forming this platform at the caudal third is doing. It's actually making the, the compression and release the, the engine of the rear of the foot rather than this expansion and contraction, in which we think, oh, we should allow the foot to do that. It's, it's you know, if you look at the ferrule foot, and when it's at its uh, premium best, it is actually working harder on compression release than it is on expansion contraction. Mm. It's really funny that you boys are saying this because my kind of observations was that the healthiest horses I had had big frogs. Um, and this was before I sort of met Mark. This was before I sort of yeah, was insane, clinic yeah. and thing. Yeah, and it, and it was kind of like sort of what you were starting to see your healthiest horses are the horses that maintain the hoof capsule without distortion. When yeah. you sort of get distortion, what they were doing was they all had one thing in common. So my obsession completely turned everything at the back of the foot and actually starting to define my work based on, right, we've got to get the back of this foot working to the yeah. point where soul was never trimmed. It was never touched. Frogs were never touched. What's very interesting with horses, horses are desperately trying to have the best foot possible in basically the most unnatural environments that these things were created for. But the compensatory effect that the horse, the, the material you can lay in, when we go back to traditional firing, we touched on this earlier on, about what people perceive as a good set of shoes and you know, a good, good money's worth is how much material's lying on the floor. Yeah. I mean, I, end up, I, I just ended up getting to the point where I say, and actually, I'm not a trimmer, I'm a lever. Do you know what I mean? You know, I'm, yeah. not going to, yeah. I'm not going to remove something that that animal is laying down because it has some sort of challenge that yeah. I do not know going on somewhere else. I've just done a webinar, which I was saying that, you know, when you're going to, and I teach all the students, when you're mm -hmm. going to approach a horse, please don't take any tool that can remove tissue. Just take a wire yeah. brush or whatever. But that, if you've wire got brush. that tool in your hand, you're going to use it. Uh, yeah. I mean, just it's, to be sort of. It's not about, yeah. sorry to jump in. It's no, no, not no. about saying that you shouldn't remove it. It's that you should, you should have an awful lot of thought process behind what you want to remove, isn't it? Yeah. yeah, yeah it's yeah, harder yeah. to think when you've got a knife in your hand, Mark. Mm -hmm. <laughs> 
<laughs> Do you know what? Uh, I, I just sort of always wanted to use this opportunity. I've got one thing that I have to get out there in the big wide world. Okay, is, is it, it, when, when you have horses in exceptionally, exceptionally poor conditions, the last part of the frog to start basically peeling away and different things like that in in nasty conditions is that first from the tip of the frog back to that yeah. first inch why yeah. or why or why the first thing a farrier does is trim that off yeah. when he's busy shoeing it's sacrilege <laughs> every I, I, single I, I, picture on social media even yeah. trimmers are doing this is the carbon yeah. frog this is the only thing that a horse will desperately preserve in absolutely yeah. diabolical yeah. conditions you Mark know, will tell you, I, um, I'm, you know, I've never stopped talking about it. And in, the, in my book, I put this picture saying, please, it's, it's just a lump of frog, but it is right under the attachment of the deep flexor tendon. Absolutely. And, and, and absolutely. it is trying to, button, you know, the self-healing process is to say that if that's the only thing I've got to balance this foot with, that's what I'll use. That's and then we come along yeah. with a knife and we cut it off. <laughs> we'll cut it off. It's oh. unbelievable, guys. Why are us three the only ones? I mean, why aren't we, you know, why are we the unusual ones? I don't ones? think we are, Robbie. I don't believe that no, we are by no, any means. No, we're not. We're not. In the education room, we are not the majority yet. No, no, no. But the challenge that we have is the desire to learn is there. The challenge that we have is when you get our peers together, they can't agree on what yeah. is a good thing or a bad thing. And that is the human condition, which is... Yeah ego you you throw all that in and and it really frustrates me because you're only as good as your last set of shoes or your last trim but actually with respect to that you're only as good as how you've left that animal to function within an environment that an owner has chosen for it not what the horse has chosen for it absolutely and until absolutely. we start until we start going back and taking these amazing creatures and saying right this was what it was designed to do how can we now start replicating this to a certain degree and then getting our very, very young stock and giving them the best start possible in life, develop digital cushions, develop these lateral cartilages, develop this blood supply that's so absolutely prevalent in the healing process, get adequate laminae development so we don't have hoof capsule distortions. Then if you want to shoe the horse, I don't care. Do you know what I mean? But don't put all that on to a juvenile foot that's now having to hold up an adult horse, you know, until, you know, we're supposed to be here for welfare. It's a nonsense, the oh, amount of cruelty nonsense. that we will they look back in 50 years and say, this is this is disgusting what we've done for these creatures. Yeah. And we come under the Animal Welfare Act and, um, you know, it has always disturbed me and, and I fought very hard even when I was teaching at the college. And when I went up recently, well, I say recently, a couple of years ago, I went up to Stonely and I was given a chance to have my say about barefoot coming into the curriculum of the farrier, the students. And I've been told, or Mark and I have been told that it is going to be in the next uh, curriculum. And when I heard, you know, what was going to be taught, I was quite saddened because we've got young people coming into the profession who would have the chance not to turn away from steel, but just to have it as another tool in their bag or to have as a, a good GP will refer you. I mean, you don't want to go into your local surgery and for the doctor to say, look, you've got a heart problem. If you want to wait till after the surgery, I'll, I'll do a transplant out the back. You don't want to hear that. You want to be referred to somebody who knows what they're talking about. There needs to be a far greater understanding of cause and effect. That that's for sure. Yeah. To come in. Yeah. Well, I think yeah. that's why. I mean, uh, oh, sorry. Yeah. So Alicia, Alicia, sorry, <laughs> so Alicia, you're still here. Okay, he's he's gone. Gone. Here, Alicia. <laughs> <laughs> I was just going to say that. I mean, this is why I love these conversations. I think there's so many people that would agree with what you're saying or feel passionate about the same things that you all feel passionate about. And because I haven't worked with metal and I don't have that experience, I feel like it limits what I can speak to. And obviously you all have experience with using metal and not, and you've seen changes and you've seen how the horses respond. And I would love if maybe you can touch on that too a little bit. Um, in in 86, I opened the hospital, which was dedicated to just referral cases from vets and farriers. And we had our own x-ray units. We had nurses, uh, uh, so the horses would come and stay with us. And my experience was, um, I, I thought I was a god. I had horses turning up with farriers, which was lovely. I was putting all sorts of surgical shoes on, mainly steel, probably 80% steel. And then slowly the, the plastics increased. But nevertheless, I realize now, looking back, 
that I was treating these horses, but I wasn't curing them. I wasn't facilitating self-healing, which is now what I realized, um, certainly with barefoot, is easier to do. But at the time, I was getting horses, and we're talking um, really high-grade Olympic horses. We're talking, you know, horses that were performing at the top of their skills, and we were we were looking for half an inch more extension, and we had rubber floors marking out uh, uh, measurements and, and all the things that we were doing. And if you took the shoes off, the horses were reverting to their original problems. So what I was doing was putting something on like a Band-Aid, and my experience was that why is it that I'm having to, to continually present a situation where the horse improves? Why can't the horse do it itself? And I look back, you know, through my records on most horses and realized, OK, so we started to put that one in plastic. So we left that one uh, for a while with the shoes off and it seemed to get a lot better. So slowly we realized that steel was part of the problem, not the cure. Can I jump in on the word support? Am I allowed to, Alicia? Yeah. <laughs> we, it, it's just, it's, it's a little bugbear and it kind of fits in the slot a little bit. We use the word support when it comes to supporting feet an awful lot, certainly, um, you know, throughout farrier and hoof care generally. And I always sort of fall to three analogies. One is support for mental illness. The other would be support for a collapsing building. And then we've got the support for a foot. Now, that's the same word used in three separate scenarios. Mental illness, we used to use metal hundreds of years back when we imprisoned people with, me with mental illness. Thankfully, we found a lot better ways forward with that. But then we come to a collapsing building that you want to be rigid, secure, firm, not moving. So we put in an RSJ. And then you'll, you'll bring in support to a foot along the same principles but the foot has got none of the properties of a collapsing building yet we still put in an rsj and it's just yeah it, good it's point. just absolutely i don't get it and but the, the but the more the more intriguing bit is what i can't get my head around so much is why i mean the three of us on this podcast obviously all think the same way but why is there this this difference in thought process and then it's definitely there. And it, it, that is a, is a very interesting one. And I haven't got any answers for that. But Sorry, I just wanted to throw that in. Thank you. Yeah, no. Oh, right, right. Good point. Well, I do think, too, something that I, I don't know if you guys have these conversations with owners, but something that I find myself saying again is, you know, what are we asking our horse to do? And is it something they should be doing? Because I don't necessarily, in my business, want to have an owner riding a horse on compromised feet that don't that yeah. shouldn't carry a rider but i know that there are plenty of people where they you know they can take a horse with feet that shouldn't be able to do anything and they can yep. put something on and they can go you know they could you know compete at high levels and it's just, to me it's a difference of perspective or a difference of thought process completely in that you know i want that foot as healthy as possible and even if that means not working if that yeah. like yeah, not, well, I, not competing, I mean, totally, totally in your camp with that one, definitely. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I've realised that maybe it's because I've got to that age where I will instruct owners. You know, either I'm not interested in in uh, uh, carrying on because of what they want to do to the to the horse, because my client is the horse; they just pay the bills. And I realised very early doors that if I was to enjoy my profession, I took the horse first, and subsequently I ended up doing more hacks and endurance riders in, in this country anyway. People who uh, realise that the, the better they looked after the horse, the, I don't know, the more rosettes or the more fun they had, which, you know, suited my way of, of working. And I, f f to that end, I started to not do a tremendous amount of competition horses. And I was doing Olympic standard horses. And I realised, well, what am I doing here? I'm just trying to get the horse to do something the owner wants, not what the horse wants. And that changed my whole sort of concept of the client I wanted and ending my shoeing days with clients that were great. They they all came with me, were all about all but probably four or five came with me when I said, look, I'm going to be going barefoot. And they said, fine, if that's what you're, you're going to do, we'll do it. And the way that I was shoeing at that time, which was no more than four nails in any shoe, I had actually sole pressure around the peripheral edge. I had broad, thin shoes. 
And when I took these shoes off for horses, most of them, I say most, it, it, you know, over 90% of them went through transition, absolutely no problem at all. Wow. I think it's quite interesting because it's quite, every time we speak, guys, we keep opening a can of worms that probably <laughs> needs an entire afternoon for to sit and discuss. And I mean, you know, we're probably talking 120 years worth of experience here as well. <laughs> I'm not there to tell an owner what to do and what not to do with the horse. I'm there to educate and I'm there to 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 try and demonstrate that they can get more out their horse if that horse is healthy. So the feet themselves, for me, were never the problem. Feet are an environmental barometer as to how healthy that animal's living accommodation is, where it lives, what it eats, right. the environment it goes out in. That's what a foot is. Feet, feet are victims of biomechanical challenges. They're victims of poor diet. They're victims of stress. They're, you know, and for me, I got an awful flack when I kind of started predominantly shoeing natural balance, but that was kind of how I was taught as an apprentice anyway. And then I just thought everybody else was doing this. I always thought the goal of of what we were doing with feet, setting feet up, was so that they could go longer without shoes. And it wasn't until computers and the forums started and different things like that that you, that you started realising there was this whole other subculture being created through horse owners that actually had horses that they cared about the horse ends up breaking for whatever reason. £2,000 per limb is spent, insurance money is gone, and they still have a lame horse. And all your high-profile chaps that are there working with the vets and all this kind of stuff, they just walk away from these guys. And little old me kind of trying to make a name for yourself and just trying to get around and stuff, you were picking up a lot of these horses. And the first thing you would do is go, right, let's just take the shoes off. Let's just give it a month. Let's just see what happens. Let's just give the horse some rest and see what happens. And within a couple of weeks, you're getting phone calls. Can you come and see my horse? And you're like, oh, geez, what's going on? Is it worse? And they weren't. They were improving. So it's interesting. Why did we turn into observing and learning more about trimming and different things like that? Was because the horse owner themselves, they started driving this catalyst. And they were driving it because modern science was not able to recover these animals. And then now we get back to certainly what we we're talking about earlier on about trimming being taught in colleges and things like that. It fills me with fear and dread because unless we get to the whole point and purpose of why we're here and, and what our rules are, then I think it'll just land on its head. Exactly what happened when four-point trimming turned up and it was a bit of a disaster. It had to be rebranded and different things like that. What we are doing is taking horses in compromised environments and we're trying to ask them to do what the owner wants. Our role is to try and achieve that. And for me, it got to the point where it was less about shoeing, a little bit about trimming, and it became more about looking at the environment looking at the horse's mental state and supplementing to compensate and for the, for the aid the horse in that. Then my feet recovered. I also had an awful lot of horses that actually never had any issues. We just had horses that were unshod. And because nobody at the time was doing the whole trimming and things like that, you ended up getting more and more of these horses for to look after. I believe I think I was probably the first person to take all my clients and actually be completely. It was about nine months where I, I wasn't shoeing any horses and about half my clients were taken out of shoes and remain without horseshoes. But I think what I have to remember is, is, is to get to that point in that journey. You can't do it without horse owners. You can't do it without their enthusiasm, their love for the horses mm. and their desire to learn as well. One person can't learn all this. You need multiple people feeding in with their experience. And before you become good at this job, which which we are very good at this job, you have to be able to listen and observe. And if you start getting it wrong, to step back and question every single thing that you do. That's my soapbox. I do like the soapbox. I think, I think ever since myself and Robbie first began talking, it's been your thing, Robbie, hasn't it, to be creating that team 
that support network of a team absolutely and, yeah. and without it you, you're kind of really fighting i, I get um tremendous amount of, of joy out of forming a team and um funnily enough yesterday had a client who's whose bet isn't in favor of barefoot and and right from the start i said you know at this point this is where you as the delegator that's the owner's job by the way they don't have to know anything about horses if they're a good delegator whether it's to their groom their vet their saddler their clipper their farrier whoever it is and they just want to stand on the mountain block that's fine by me as long as they're delegated to a good team the vet did not like the idea of barefoot and I said, I, you know, you've got two choices. You go with me, in which case you change your vet, or you go with him, in which case you change your farrier. There, there, there's no fun for me working with somebody who, and it's no fun for the owner to be put in the middle of who am I meant to go with, who do I believe, um, you know, what, what am I going to do? I, I bring in a nutritionist, a, a saddler, a physiotherapist, a, whoever they want to, to form the team. But we have to have everybody pushing in the right way for the horse. The owner's there to pay the bills and have fun, hopefully, but they pay the bills, but they get a team that is right behind them with what they want to do, but primarily it's what the horse horse is is going to be doing for them and in and, and to follow on from Matthew's part the, the 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 thing in this country is we have more compromise than the most developed countries equine countries in the world and um, we are dealing with wetter conditions with crowded livery yards with poor grass conditions all the things that we come across um, I realize speaking to other people throughout the world, you know, that they it, it seems to all come down in this country to, to a pile of stuff that we have to go through with the owner, whether it's nutrition, conditions or trimming. Whereas, you know, you can in most countries at least get some point uh, of dry, arid conditions at some point in the year and trimmers who I think are right up there with knowing what they're doing. And, and at the moment, through our education system for farriers, through our knowledge of what you buy for food and our um, lack of inclusion on nutritionists at an early stage of learning, add to that the conditions we have, which is high nitrates, high producing ground. We are creating all sorts of problems that we're having to compromise or the horse is having to compromise with, which shouldn't happen to happen. And so, and so many places basically are offering accommodation without accommodating, aren't they? And we're fighting yeah. all the time against contamination mm -hmm. because we just don't have the space, you know, contaminated ground, contaminated pasture, just simply because it's overused. We don't have that luxury of, of rotation. And, um, and although the, the track systems are popping up now here, thank goodness, but um, nowhere near enough so. i think what kind of really worries me is that you know we've got we've got young people learning this trade and they're not being given the tools to, yeah. to sort of do their job properly i mean it, it's like i don't want any young person coming into farrowry having the anxieties and sleepless nights that we've had because we can't fix a horse do you yeah. know what I mean? Because that pressure's yeah, yeah. there that you are going to, you know, Farrery, you know, Farrery has this myth about it that you're going to make this horse better. It's the biggest pile of nonsense I've ever heard in my life. The horse has to make itself better through treatment from the inside out. The foot itself is only how healthy the horse is. Anything else that we attach to it or strap onto it is a bandage. Do you know what I mean? It, it, it's and if we can start breaking this down, it, I think we will stop having the difficulties when some poor chaps maybe he's worked on a horse for two or three years, then it goes a bit poorly. Oh, the the referral farriers come in, and all of a sudden that person's put off to one side. That person didn't create that problem. That farrier is only dealing with the poor upbringing the horse has had, the lack of development that that horse has had. And, and the environment in which that horse is in. And if we can break these myths down and better and better educate these guys, I think the next generation of farriers are going to have way more fun than what we ever did because they'll be problem solving that little bit better and a little bit different. It almost helps, like you were talking about earlier, Matt, I think you were saying that um, it helps to think of it as not all our responsibility. I mean, the crushing weight of saying, like, I have to make this horse better is is yeah. terrifying because we can't yeah. you know we, we can't do it on our own and just focusing no. on the mm -hmm. whole horse and the environment and the diet and the movement and the mm -hmm. confirmation and you know that is is has so much more effect than what we do to the can meat. i just can i just 
chip in that I suggested years ago that a farrier should go to college rather like a vet. So he go, doesn't need to go for three years, but could go through college for a year, learn um, everything that the college has, including composite shoes and plastics and x-rays and all the things, and rather like a vet student. And the reason I came up with this idea is a vet said to me one day that was at my clinic, he said, you do realize when we take on a young vet student we love it because we learn what's coming next because they're at these places where they're seeing innovation and they're knowing what what drugs and what what um, you know whether it's digital or, and and he said we learn from the students that come to our practice and farriers if they were taught early doors all the things about nutrition condition and trimming when they go then to be placed with a master they're going to start to also educate the master and that's what would, would yeah. be great. I'm not. I'm not talking about the bottom leading the top, but I am talking about masters realizing if they change their ways, they're going to have a better time. I mean, how many people have gained? I certainly gained through not having to carry an anvil around. And I'm sure Mark's the same. Is is that by just going out with my my toolbox and I could I get a smaller vehicle, I could have more time with the client. The whole your, your whole you know body structure changes, and you don't make less money. If farriers are wondering about what money you make, you don't make less money, but you do enjoy your job a lot more. But I mean, Robbie, it's like I mean, my kind of big bug bugbear with all this is that could you imagine teaching lads and lasses right at the beginning of their career? that they are not responsible for the health of that foot. The health of that foot is responsible for the people that care for it, not the yeah. hour that you spend every six weeks. But how what much you, time did you spend with the owner, Matt? Oh, hours, hours. Yeah, yeah. Hours, and that, that's, you know. where, and that's what your knowledge and my knowledge and Mark's knowledge and, and Alicia knows that we as a team, the four of us on this phone call tonight are people who would talk to an owner knowing that is the way through to treating the horse yeah. in the way that we need it treated. Yeah. Sorry, I didn't to me, to draw, I yeah, didn't. no, no. I mean, to me, it doesn't matter what you put on a horse's foot. Do you know what I mean? You know, if that well, animal is in... Well, if that animal is in trouble, <laughs> you are not you are not going to stop the trouble that's happening. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. Uh, yeah. You know, th these poor guys putting on steel shoes. Do you know what I mean? You know, yeah. it will break. Do you know what I mean? That was my first lesson at college. It will break. But this is what we do. And this is how we manage horses so that we minimize damage. I've got a book from the 1700s and they're talking about horse purchasing and they're saying, don't touch a frog, uh, don't touch a horse with a skinny frog. It has yeah. to be two thirds the mass of the foot, two thirds the mass of the foot. Do you imagine mm. the size of those digital cushions and lateral cartilages? Do you yeah. imagine how massive the arterial and venous feed is going to be in that foot? Not mm. compared to the inbred thoroughbreds that have washed nearly all breeds now and given them pitiful, useless feet. You know, um, and then some poor sap straight out of college has to try and tack a shoe on and try and hold <laughs> it on for six weeks. Yeah. It's not fair on young people learning the trade because Just to all this information map. is not well, there. Do you family. think that we've got the, these Derek Poupard, you know, has done a wonderful job and, and you're getting amazing uh, things, whether it's on Facebook or, or, or you know, an amazing amount of YouTube picture and, and young farriers, as you say, who are given this responsibility of showing a a compromised foot and they're putting these pads on so oh you know the owners are thrilled and i'm thrilled and we're getting great results i don't know whether people are actually spotting you know why we're needing them that's the bigger question robbie and i think that's the one thing that actually i think this is the sadness about barefoot in this country because when it came about it it, it was very militant to begin with because it was people <laughs> well if you think about it 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 was people with horses that were struggling and they had nowhere else to turn to to try and fix it. Yeah. And the fact they were going on the internet and they were finding out a little bit of information and that was making a huge difference to their horse. Why would they not share that with the rest of the horse population in the same situation? I mean, people like us, all we did was jump on the same bad wagon seeking answers. And very early on, I mean, you were not, as a farrier, you were not wanted in these environments. But once you got into those environments, the wealth of knowledge was just phenomenal. You know, I was only ever as good as the horse owners that I had. I was only ever as good as the people that were prepared to share their knowledge. You know, what we do with that knowledge, that's what makes us good. And the only way that farrier is going to progress is that this information is shared in an unheated and unemotive way 
for young people to start having this better foundation of what they're going into the fiery world and what they're going to encounter. And that has to be a multi-pronged approach, but it has to be done. Uh, who who can we get to do it? Do you know what I mean? Because <laughs> the whole system it's it's is so us. stitched up by who your mates are, you know? Yeah, it's, yeah. it's bonkers. I think what needs to be recognised at some point is that certainly... I think I'm speaking to Matthew as well. When we when we first really started to get into barefoot, there were some incredibly talented trimmers in this country um, yeah. initially, and the the knowledge flow was just so generous. And it, speaking personally, it certainly catapulted me forward with my my thinking. But the the thing was that they they'd all uniformly come from having to be problem solvers, very much like yeah. your own story, yeah. Alicia. You know when the way that you came into it, you had a problem, you had to try and solve it. Right. And, yeah. and there's, there's this freedom. I know, I know when you were very first saying about how, yes, we've got regulations here and you haven't, but, but just look at the innovation that comes from the States. You know, mm. it's fantastic. The free thinking and the, the, the lack of constraint um, that's, that's there. And I, I think if we could only embrace more from, from people who have had to, to find solutions themselves you know we, we'd be a lot more richer uh, in, in terms of yeah, yeah. yeah. i think yeah. what was always sad you know when we ran sort of uh, you know when we sort of like taught trimming and ran clinics and did talks and things i think what was always sad i mean the first thing i would say to a group of folk is right hands up anybody who's here because you got a poorly horse you know and they'll all put that the hand up in that room and i'll say right okay I may not be able to show you how to fix that horse, but we're going to explore how you go on a road to potentially fix the next horse that you have. Take the horse that you've got that's poorly. If you fix it, all fantastic. But that horse will teach you more about what not to do within the environment that you're in than anything else, you know? And and it's if they can and it was really sad because people were going into this barefoot movement and different things like that. And it's a shame it was hijacked like this because Farrowy should have picked up the gauntlet of this. And because yeah. that didn't happen, we've been put back 20, 30 years. Yeah. And and I think it's a shame because again, the the problem solving that these people did to get their animals back so they can enjoy them you know, quite a lot of them militantly didn't share it. They were very sceptical of people around them. They, they were terrified that potentially what they did was wrong. And actually our current environment, of our teaching environment within Farrowy, we're still more or less implying that barefoot is bad. You know, yeah. if a horse... I was, I was told that by the high rock. Yeah, yeah. If, <laughs> if a barefoot horse can trot down a road or walk across a yard without shoes on, and then you take shoes off a horse and it can't do that. Where's what's the healthiest horse there? Do you know what I mean? You know, oh it well, needs I, shoes I, on. No, I it said doesn't. That, <laughs> I said to that last week, if if you actually say that there's no point that, that you would not allow this horse to be barefoot, is there any point when you would insist on it being shod? And he said, uh, you know, uh, and to me, this is the crux of it, is that when we're certainly are, as you know, we're now in trying to convince insurance companies that you should be asking for a horse um, to be sound with the shoes off at the seller's convenience on, 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 a, on, a, on a surface that the seller says that, that, you know, if it's feathers, that's absolutely fine. But if you if a horse won't go sound on, on any surface at all without shoes, that horse is lame. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, absolutely. There's no point saying, you know, well, he's fine with shoes on. Well, you know, he's not with them shoeing off. So, uh, exactly. and that's that's on a soft condition. When they say, oh, he's fine when you turn him out in the field, that's that's great. Let him out in the field. But do not tell me that, you know, that a horse is sound when it can only be sound with shoes on. Yeah. And, and, I, and, and I think that sort of falls back to the sort of key part to it, you know, is how much these horses are adaptive and compensating to maintain a a levelness just to try and allow the plant to function in that day. Do you know what I mean? You know, yeah, and, yeah. and I mean, and this is and this is what we don't do. We don't look at the wild. If that horse shows lameness, it's singled out by predators. So you know what I mean. So it, it, if it's it got shoes on, the lions would have had it. Yeah, it's not sound in <laughs> shoes if I can't walk across the yard without them. Yeah. <laughs> and I I think this conversation is amazing. In fact, I wish you know 
we could probably talk for hours and I wish I could keep going. I'm going to have to get off the call soon. I guess um, maybe as like a closing way to sort of bring the conversation together, because I think there were so many things addressed in this, is is there any last minute comments or advice you want to make for farriers or for horse owners or for trimmers? You know, anything that you want to kind of leave our I, episode with? I certainly have. Yeah, I certainly have. Um, mine is observation, close observation. And take advantage of technology that we've we've all pretty much got fantastic phones now that will do slow motion. So there's two elements to this. One is have somebody walk your horse up and down and get down on the ground level, film that footfall properly, and then get up and film that body movement properly. That's that's one side of it. But the other side of it is, and especially for a hoof care provider, uh, I know I've got a lot out of this is, Drop your phone down onto the ground level and the last horse of the day, as long as it's clean and the weather conditions is under, just take a photo of that horse that you've just done. Take it home, get your favorite drink out, whatever, pop it up on the computer stream screen and just kick back and look at it. And then that very often will give you a give you its own set of feedback and you think, hang on a minute, I didn't see that. Or I could have done that better. Or maybe if I tried this next time. So my my thing is just close observation and make the use of technology that we've got to do that. Yeah. Did anybody else have something they wanted to add? It's quite an interesting question. It's difficult, isn't it? It's I think I think we've spent we've all spent a lifetime trying to put right or wrong. And I think it's very, very sad that certainly in my lifetime, the only thing that's actually really i would say has improved has actually all come from the drive of horse owners i think they need to have a round of applause for it you know because without them certainly my education certainly would have sort of been stagnated at times and also as well i mean the horses the the horse if you're quiet enough the horse will tell you what's wrong you know and that's not something you can teach a young lad or a young girl busy sort of starting fiery and things like that but I just think right across the block, you've got so many different aspects of horsemanship and different aspects of farry and all these kinds of things. I think it's about just getting back to what works for that horse. What What is it that's actually allowing that horse to have a happy day and for the horse owner to enjoy it, you know? And that was always my kind of goals, you know? It was, you know, first thing you would ask before you ever looked at the horse when you were getting referred to something, how big's your budget? You know, because you have to be realistic when you come to treat these animals, you know, and really it's up to our job and people that we all know that are very, very good at their job is about trying to get as many professionals like what Robbie's saying together for to give these guys a good fighting chance. But my sort of take home message is let's get feet developed in young horses before we ever decide what we're going to do with them. Because until we start doing that, we are not we are not progressing in our teaching, our understanding, anything. And we're not setting them up to tolerate the conditions of the UK. You know, it's, you know, horses can cope with crappy ground if they're very, very healthy. If they're unhealthy and they have got underdeveloped structure, that foot will distort. And that creates a huge challenge biomechanically, so on and so forth, you know. Um, you know, we just got to get back to basics. Yeah. And Robbie? Yeah, I mean, on my on my website, there is a, there is just a, one of my papers on, on self-healing. And I would just implore people to realize that um, we've created this, what I call the red area, which is, is this human intervention. And it's, it's not what the horse recognizes, whether it's drugs or steel, whatever it is. Um, the self-healing is, is all we can do is facilitate the, the ability for the horse to self-heal. And if you do nothing else, go on my opening page and, and just just have a look at that that thing about the paper about self healing, and and you know see if you actually recognise anything that's in that because it's what made me leave steel alone, and uh, I think to understand more about what my whole career has been about, and hopefully before I, you know, curl off this earth in in twenty summers or whatever, if I can get anything through to young farriers, it's that you are there to facilitate self healing. Thank Alicia, you. it's been brilliant. Thank yeah, you. Thank you all so much. I really love this conversation. I wish I could have stayed longer. Um, and we'll have to honestly do it again. Alicia, while you're, while you're still online, I, you know, I think what you're doing in terms of your podcast and uh, is second to none. And if, yeah, yeah. Ever, if there is ever 
an equestrian award up for it. No, 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 I'm being absolutely straight up here. <laughs> I think you, you absolutely deserve it because you're putting out some fantastic stuff. Thank well, you. Yeah, you Thank are. you so much. Well, honestly, it yeah. wouldn't be anything without all the guests who are willing to be on it and humor me with all my questions. So I really thank you for so much for being willing to sit with me for over an hour and, and just talk about, you know. It's flown by. <laughs> well, I hope you all have a great rest of your night. And thank you again. Lovely. All right. Yeah, Lovely. Take, Take care. Take care. Bye-bye. 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 I always say that I'm slightly more hoof obsessed than the average person. And chances are, if you're listening to a hoof care podcast, you are too. So we should probably be friends. Feel free to find me on Facebook or email me at thehumblehoof at gmail.com.